So does Al-Shabaab pose a threat on American soil? Joining me now with their thoughts are Omar Jamal, First Secretary of Friends of Somalia UN, a working group of the United Nations dedicated to the implementation of UN resolutions on Somalia. And from Scotland, James Ferguson, journalist and author whose latest book is The World's Most Dangerous Place Inside the Outlaw State of Somalia. Omar Jamal, James Ferguson, welcome to The Heat. Omar, why don't I start with you? You're in Minneapolis. How much of a threat does Al-Shabaab really pose to the United States? Well, thanks. Al-Shabaab has evolved from its uh, inception up until now. I think it was getting more dangerous uh, and more uh, deadly. And I think now, uh, having been uh, disbanded and, and blended into the mainstream society, it poses a more real threat not only to Somalia, but also to the whole world and to the, particularly to the region in that part of the world. And James, I'd like to get your thoughts on this. Do you think they pose a, a, a threat to the United States, the UK as well? Yeah, I mean, the danger is that well, the diaspora is very, very large. There are a lot of people out there, maybe a couple of million people with foreign passports who are entitled to travel back to the countries uh, that they've, they've gone to as refugees, as children, and that what the FBI worries about in the States is people, American Somalis, going to Somalia to fight for al-Shabaab, receiving training there, and then coming back to the U.S. with that training. Uh, that is, it hasn't happened yet. It's, a, it's kind of a dog that hasn't barked yet, but it's always possible. And the FBI know, they told me at least of a couple of dozen people, American Somalis, who have gone to fight for al-Shabaab uh, back in their home country. So that is always a risk, and the same in the U.K. Well, James, talk to me about the recruitment. I mean, what do the numbers look like? Uh, you know, and I know it's hard to kind of sift through all of this stuff, but how many people would you say they've targeted and been successful at in terms of recruiting in the UK, in Europe, and here in the United States? Well, we have to be a bit careful when we talk about recruiting because it kind of conjures up this idea of these sort of evil um, Machiavellian geniuses who are going around manipulating young people and persuading them uh, you know, adult to son, as it were, to come and join the good fight. It's not quite like that. Uh, wh what I understand from it, and, I, and this is again from sources in the FBI, who describe it as a very lateral peer-to-peer -peer process. In other words, young people tend to talk themselves into it. And if there is a recruiter at all, it is, it's the internet. It's people watching uh, footage on, on, on the internet. Sheikh Google is the man who's responsible for this. But even uh, the FBI admit they haven't managed to stop that process. They say they've, they've, they've slowed it down some, but it's likely more underground now, is what they told me. So we don't know the numbers, but it's a continuing process. It's still a problem. Uh, Omar, you're in the community there in Minneapolis, well, and I know there's been a lot of focus on, on that particular area. Give us your thoughts on this, and, and it, maybe if you can also touch on the social media aspect. I mean, even in the attack in Westgate, they had their Twitter account going at the time. It's pretty remarkable when you think about it. It is, it is, and, uh, and uh, I have to say that uh, given the process of recruitment here, uh, it is very difficult to really believe that uh, a, a young kid uh, can be uh, convinced to go back and do this uh, only through uh, media outlets or YouTubes, all of that. Uh, there has to be some physical contact. There has to be an individual who can take it one step farther by convincing the person because of course they listen to YouTubes, they listen to iBots, uh, they do all of that, they have their own circuit meetings, uh, but without having an individual with the knowledge of Al-Shabaab and, and the power of convincing other human beings to do the impossible, I think because for a young kid to drop the books and go back and commit suicide bombing is a huge step. So I think this is ongoing process. Nobody can exactly put a number on it. It's still ongoing right now as we speak. Al-Shabaab, as it is right now, is a global threat, and therefore it requires a global response. It's, it's going to be really very difficult for the international community to leave this only to Kenyan government or Somali government or to that particular region. Now Al-Shabaab has, has crossed the border and, and boasts a real threat not only to Kenya but to UK, uh, to the United States and other parts of well, Europe. Let me, let me follow up. Let me, let me, let me, hold on for just a second, Omar, because I, I, I want to touch on this, because you wrote in a recent op-ed, and I want to get your thoughts on this, and it's almost dueling op-eds, because I want to also talk about James's op-ed, but you said 
It is not a matter of whether al-Shabaab is a terrorist threat to the United States, but rather when and where it will attack. I mean, it sounds like it's almost inevitable, and you're also talking about this global threat right now. How dangerous is this as a threat? Well, one has to understand the 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 but the, 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 the issues and the machine that's driving this. This is a war. Uh, I mean, this is a real war. This is an ideo ideological war, and it's not going to be over overnight. And and the fact that it happened in Westgate Mall, or a, a Somali American kid committed suicide bombing in the other side of the globe, does not necessarily mean it will not happen here. This is an ongoing war, uh, Al Shabab in Yemen, in, in Somalia, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and all the rest of the world. So this requires an ideological response. This is a war on ideas, and it needs an, a, a, an ideal war. Um, Omar, let me, let me hold you there, because I want to uh, draw on James here, because in your op-ed, you touched on something entirely different in, in many respects. You said, given opportunities, support, and acknowledgement that Islam and violence are not synonyms, the vast majority of young diaspora Muslims are likely to reject extremism on their own. Um, more optimistic, I would say, but, but it, I also saw you nodding your head as Omar was talking. So you see what he's saying as well. Uh, clearly, yeah. they're, they're attractive to some young people. Yeah. No, there is, there, is a, there is a risk, and I, I've, I've said, I mean, there is a risk that Al-Shabaab, trained Al-Shabaab fighters could come back into the Western communities where they began and, and uh, uh, carry out acts of terrorism. That is a risk that has to be taken seriously. Uh, there have been two attacks outside uh, uh, Somalia proper, big international ones. This Westgate w was, was the, the most recent one. The last one actually was three years ago uh, in Kampala, not two years ago. They're quite few and far between. Uh, my point, I think, though, I mean, this is important, is that the vast majority of young Somalis are not potential terrorists. And we're talking about a tiny, tiny fraction of the total. And when you meet ordinary young Somalis, they are, for the most part, quite impressive people, very impressive people who have done very well uh, in diaspora communities, in the States and in Europe and Scandinavia and so on. And I'm convinced that actually they are the best chance that we've got, that Somalia have got, of of creating a better future. They, they want to go back. A great number of young Somalis are going back. Refugee Somalis are going back to Somalia now. So many, there's a housing boom going on in Mogadishu. And this is a sign of, of uh, determination to rebuild the place. And we need to support them because they are our best chance for fixing the place. It's helping Somalis to help themselves rather than uh, uh, trying to crack I, I, th I think the, 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 the idea that uh, even here in Minnesota, and the major cities in the United States, the majority of Somali people are very law-abiding, good citizens. But the point is that right. this a tiny minority group who are trying to hijack the masses of the of the population is is, is the risk. Uh, five years ago, if someone would have said that uh, Al Shabaab might attack Westgate Mall, they they might laugh at him. The same way that if someone says right now that the Al Shabaab may be carrying out some operations in London, UK, that person might sound crazy. But the fact of the matter is, these minority small group that you see have created a havoc in Somalia. They are still a commanding voice. There is still a voice to be reckoned with. So you cannot just ignore them. These, this well, is a well, real threat. Omar, and, and the sooner we start talking about them, right the better off we are. Well, Omar, let me stop you there, because I want to get back to what James talked about in his op-ed piece, which is opportunities and support. Whose responsibility is that? And it, that really is kind of the pathway to get these kids who might go in the wrong direction back on the right track. And, and why don't I start with you, James? Well, I, I think responsibility is the wrong word. I think it's, it's, our, it's common sense to do it. It would be our strategy. We ought to do it because it's in our own interests. Uh, there is, I mean, you know, Omar is right. There is a serious threat from uh, Shabab-linked terrorism. But why do people join al-Shabab? For the most part, it's because they are alienated from the societies that they live in, whether in Somalia or in the West. Uh, they lack opportunities. They lack the possibility of jobs, education, security, housing. They're fed up with corruption and clanism. Those are the things that you address. If you remove the quite often legitimate grievances that young people have, uh, then you also remove the motivation for joining al-Shabaab. Omar, uh, I'll give you the final word on this. Is further needed to stop the radicalization, and is James' uh, solution the right one? My, my, my concern and my fear 
is that sometimes you see a kid from wealthy family with everything that is gone back and, and, and committed a very heinous crime. This, this transcends the concept of, of, uh, uh, of, of a current individual situation. This is a, a real war. I think this is an ideological war. Uh, but the fact of the matter is there seems to be a lacking of aggressive outreach into youth employment, uh, mentorships, education. The sooner that's done, I think the better of everyone will be. I think both of you stand in agreement on that uh, issue right there. James, Omar, thank you both for uh, spending some time here on The Heat. Thank you.